Yes, Jesus, we come to you this morning, Lord, in the midst of a world that doesn't make sense. Whether that's far away or whether that's close to home, God, we are in need of you. And so, Lord, we come to you and we ask, would you speak to us? Would you speak what is true this morning? We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. So, I was talking to my boys the other day around the dinner table, and I was asking them, what would you do if you had a friend who was hurting? And I think my youngest son misunderstood completely what I was getting at, and he thought that somehow a bully was involved in this situation. And he said, well, I would come up to that bully and I would say, hey, bully, get out of here. I said, well, son, I'm not really talking about a bully. So my, son, my other son said, well, I would come up to my friend and I would ask what had happened. And my other son said, I would bring him a Band-Aid. And then my youngest son pipes up again and says, I'd put my arm around him. And then I'd say, hey, let's go get some ice cream. I said, good answer. That's a good answer. So we're working our way through the book of Job and asking the question, asking many questions, actually, about when God doesn't make sense. And last week, Brent was talking about how do we suffer wisely and well. And he was looking at Job and his heart-rending, gut-wrenching lament to God, the raw emotion that came out of all that he was experiencing. And this morning, I want us to take a little bit of a different look. We're going to be looking at the same massive part in the middle of the book of Job, chapters 3 to 31, kind of give an aerial view this morning again. But we're going to be looking not as much at the person of Job and his words as much as we're going to be looking at the friends. And the question that I want us to ask this morning is how do we come alongside of those who are suffering and in pain and in loss? There's an Irish proverb that says, it's in the shelter of each other that people live. What kind of shelters do we provide for those who are in the midst of a storm? What kind of shelters do we provide for those who can't stand on their own? For, for those whose life is in pieces? For those who don't know where to go? In the experience of Job, his friends didn't provide him with the shelter that he needed. As we've seen and as we'll see today, they blame him. They accuse him, they were harsh with him, and impatient with him. And community and friendship can be this double-edged sword, right? Friendship and community, church community, those closest to us, can certainly provide healing in times when we are in our darkest moments. But it can also inflict its own pain, sometimes through misspoken words or misguided actions. And if we're honest with ourselves, we've all been Job's friends at some time or another, I think is fair to say. As Brent said last week, it's pretty obvious as we read through the book of Job who we're called to be and who we're called not to be. We certainly look at the person of Job and we see a man who suffered wisely, a man who suffered well, and we see God saying, look at my servant Job, be like him. Be like him. And we look at the friends, and it's quite obvious to our eyes, we do not want to be like them. But this is a difficult thing to do. Part of our calling as followers of Jesus is to be walking with him and to be walking in his ways. And that means coming alongside of those who are suffering and are in pain. To be the hands and feet of Jesus and at times to be the voice of Jesus. And so I'm trusting that as we look in the scriptures today, as we look at this middle section of Job, we're going to see both some landmines that we want to avoid, some things we shouldn't say, some places we shouldn't go. But I also think we're going to see some landmarks that are going to be helping us to navigate, to give us some orientation to how we walk with those in pain. So how do we do this? How do we walk alongside those who are experiencing suffering, pain, and loss? And I'll be honest with you this morning. I don't have all the answers to that question. 
And I'll be honest with you, I don't think that the book of Job has all the answers to that specific question. But I do think it gives us enough pieces to go after, enough things we can cling to. And it's a good starting point as we ask this question. So let's turn to Job chapter 4. We're going to go there in a minute, in just a moment. Job chapter 4. I want to show you this painting that I, I found this past week. This was painted in 1825 by the British artist and poet William Blake. And it's entitled, Job Rebuked by His Friends. You can see Job's wife on the left-hand side. She's, just before this scene, told Job to curse God and die. We see Job in the middle there, covered in sores and boils, at the end of himself. And then we see the friends. And they've got these fingers that extend out towards Job, and they point, and they accuse, and they wave, and they lecture, and wag at him. And the friends, just before this scene, had come to Job in the midst of his despair, in the midst of his his dark moment of, God, what is going on in my life? And they sat with him for seven days. They wept with him for seven days. They didn't say a single word for seven days. But as soon as Job speaks in chapter 3, what Pastor Brent spoke last week on, as soon as he speaks, he's done speaking, they can't help but open their mouth. And this is where they first go wrong. So let's jump into Job chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 3 to 5 and 7 to 8. And it says this. This is Eliphaz, the first friend to speak after Job has just bared his soul to God. He says, Behold, you have instructed many, and you have strengthened the weak hands. Your words have upheld him who is stumbling, and you have made firm the feeble knees. But now it's come to you, and you are impatient. It touches you, and you are dismayed. Remember, who that was innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Chapters 4 and 5 give us much of the heart and the content of the rest of what's going to come in the middle section of Job. There's a, a lot of back and forth between the three friends and Job, and the friends end up saying a lot of the same things. The first thing that the friends did was to boldly jump into a conversation that they had no right pursuing. Job has just brought his raw emotions to God, and the friends just couldn't let his lament hang there. They couldn't give him that moment. They couldn't give him the time or the space in order to express himself or to process things. They just had to get a word in there. And if you read through chapters 4 and 5 in full, you'll see that not only do they look to get a word in, Eliphaz begins by speaking over twice as many words as Job's lament in the first place. There's a a mental health nurse and a theologian and author named John Swinton. And he says, the practice of friendship and the practice of silence are inextricably linked, specifically in the instance of walking with someone in suffering. To be good friends, especially a good friend to someone who's suffering, requires that we have an awareness and a patience and a wisdom to know when to keep our mouth shut. You can say the correct things and you can still get things completely wrong, right? Now, I'm just going to ask the men a question here this morning on that note. Let me just check with you. I'm I'm just guessing, just wondering. There's never been a time when you've said something out of turn, has there? Specifically in regards to a conversation with your spouse? No? Okay, good. I'm glad because I was hoping I wasn't the only man here that that's happened to. I'm guessing that there's been times when you've said something that has been, in your mind, correct. You've perhaps brought some perspective. You've brought some solution 
to the situation. That's a landmine, by the way. Solutions. What does your spouse, man, what does your spouse want in that moment when they are sharing something with you that at times doesn't make complete sense to you? They're venting, they're bearing their soul to you. Do they want a solution? No. What do they want? They want you to listen. They want you to know that you are listening, that you care, that you hear them, that you see them, that you're in that with them. And the time will come later to have further conversations and perhaps to bring your solution. But when they're sharing isn't the time to be doing that, is it? You walk away from that conversation turned argument with your spouse and you think, how did I get that wrong? Well, watch out for the solutions. Watch out for the fixing. May I suggest to you, though, that if you have a friend who's suffering, particularly a friend who is in the middle of a lament, maybe not unlike what we saw with Job last week in chapter 3, give that person some space. Be patient. Be patient with them. Brent talked about being an armchair theologian versus a wheelchair theologian. And the, the armchair theologian speaks out of not experience, not out of wisdom, but out of oftentimes speculation or a fix-it attitude. The wheelchair theologian, though, doesn't come at things from speculation and from fixing things. They come at it from experience and from wisdom, from having walked that road themselves. And some of you have walked, and some of you are currently walking, a particular road of suffering. And I just want to acknowledge that you have insights, you have perspectives to offer that are unique to the road that you have walked, and we need you. We need your voice. But for many of us, knowing when to keep our mouths shut is in and of itself a form of wisdom. Dory Laub, who's, who was a Holocaust survivor, said, be imminently but unobtrusively present. Be imminently but unobtrusively present. He was saying, be all there. Be fully present, but don't get in the way. Don't make it about yourself. What I am not saying is to not go near someone who's suffering or to avoid them or to even avoid speaking with them, but be thoughtful and intentional and be patient with them. And some practical things that we can still do, even if speaking into a person's life is at the moment inappropriate or the timing is not there or the words you have are not for that moment, be present with them. If appropriate, put an arm around them. Sit with them. Weep with them, hold their hand, offer to pray with them, ask if you can bring a meal or do something helpful around the house, or just simply say, I am so, so sorry. So jumping back into our passage, looking at verses 7 and 8, I'll just read this again. Eliphaz says, remember, who that was innocent ever perished, or where were the upright cut off? As I've seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Not only was the timing of the friend's speech off, it wasn't the time to speak, but so too, as we see and as we will see, is their content and their attitude or their posture in bringing the words they're bringing. Eliphaz in chapters 4 and 5 is a lot more gentle than he's going to get in later chapters and a lot more gentle than the friends will get in later chapters. But it's, it's undeniable that there is this, this implicit underlying thing that he is communicating right from the start. In the friends' framework that they have, their operating system for how the world works, how they see things, how they see God working in the world, God is fair, which is true, to a, he's true, and he's just, which is true. And we can see, this is where they deviate. They say, you can see who is righteous and who is unrighteous simply by looking at what happens to them in their life. 
It's the retribution principle that we covered just a couple weeks ago. You reap what you sow. And in their case, they think that this is always the case. If you do good things, good things will happen to you. If you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. It's as if Eliphaz is saying, you know, Job, you've helped a lot of people in their distress. Now it's your time to receive some words of advice. And here's my words of advice to you. The world is ordered. You know this, Job. God is just. He's fair. And good things happen to those who are good and bad things happen to those who are bad. You know, it's true. It, you know what? I don't need to get into it too much. But 28 chapters go by and they get into it. What's implicit is that if Job is experiencing suffering, pain, or loss in their framework, then he must have done something to deserve it. And some people talk about karma, a principle that is within Hinduism and Buddhism, where each person is rewarded or punished according to that person's deeds in a previous life. And it's a different concept, but, but there's a similar kind of logic to what the friends are talking about here. And this is their logic. Bad things happen to bad people. You're suffering bad things. So you must have done something to deserve this. And let me just say, the friends aren't entirely without scriptural backing at this point. Proverbs eleven eighteen says, the wicked, de- earn, the wicked earn deceptive wages. The one who sows righteousness gets a reward. Proverbs 22, 8 says, whoever sows injustice reaps calamity. So the friends aren't entirely wrong here, but they're not giving the full picture. You can see what Eliphaz is getting at even when he talks about, I have seen that. He's leaning into life experience to show that this is the case. And it's true. Our choices do have consequences. Sometimes, and I want to stress this, sometimes we suffer because we make poor choices. But what do we learn back in Job chapter 1 and 2, the first sermon that Brent preached? Job is innocent. He is not suffering because he has sinned. Elsewhere in the scriptures, though, we find evidence that things are not always so cut and dry, so black and white. Life is complex and doesn't always make sense. Things don't always go the way that they should. Ecclesiastes 7.15 says, The righteous perish in their righteousness, and the wicked live long in their wickedness. Ecclesiastes 8.14 says, The righteous get what the wicked deserve, and the wicked get what the righteous deserve. Job eventually himself calls his friends out on this, saying, while it's true that we reap what we sow, it's also true that sometimes we get what we don't deserve. In Job 21.7, he says to them, Why do the wicked live, reach old age, and grow mighty in power? Gosh, if that verse doesn't seem like it's speaking into our current political moment internationally, I don't know what does. And of course, the most prominent example of an innocent sufferer that we see in the scriptures is Jesus himself, blameless, innocent, crucified on our behalf for our sins. Brent mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but I just want to bring it to our attention again. And if you only take away a handful of things from this series, let this be one of those. All sin leads to suffering, but not all suffering is because of sin. And some of you need to let that sink in this morning. Some of you need to let it sink in and remove some of the guilt that you are carrying. And some of you have had Job-like fr- Job friends, sorry, Job friend-like friends speak into your life and make false assumptions about what you've done, about what you're experiencing how that relates to what you deserve and that it's warranted. And this is not always true. Some of you need to hear that. All suffering or all sin leads to suffering, but not all suffering is because of sin. The story of Job just shatters certain beliefs and assumptions and common perceptions about how suffering works. While it is generally true that we reap what we sow, It is not always 
the case. It's not always true that if I love and follow God, that nothing bad will ever happen to my family. It just isn't true. How many of you have heard it said? I don't need to see a show of hands, but how many of have heard it said or have perhaps even said it yourself, you say that the safest place to be is in God's will. Now listen, I recognize the heart behind this sentiment. I recognize that it's an attempt to comfort or encourage or that perhaps when we come out of a dangerous situation, we can point back and say, I was right where God wanted me to be. He was with me the whole time. He protected me. That was the safest place I could have been. But to say to someone, it just doesn't line up to reality. And it doesn't have biblical backing. Try telling Job that the safest place to be is in God's will. It is not the safest place to be, but it is the best place to be. The best place to be is in God's will, but that doesn't always mean that it is the safest. Because when we say things like this, it can unintentionally communicate that if you're suffering, you must not be in God's will. But Job's story tells us a completely different story. Now, Job's friends can only make sense of his suffering from within the framework where he is guilty and that he is receiving what is due to him. And so they repeatedly encourage him to admit his wrong. They say, repent so that God would bless you again. If you would only admit your wrong, Job, God would bless you again. And in a sneaky, awful way, this really puts them, and if we say these kinds of things, it puts us into a position of moral superiority. It's as if you're saying, listen, you're suffering because you did this. But really, what we're also communicating is, because I'm not suffering, I deserve God's blessing and protection somehow. I'm somehow living in a better way than you are. Do you hear how this comes across? So later on in the book of Job, in Job 8, verse 3, the friends say, does God pervert justice? Are you second-guessing God here, Job? Or in Job 11, verse 4, they say, for you say my doctrine is pure. I am clean in God's eyes. Do you think you know better than God, Job? Or in Job 18, verse 3, why are we counted as cattle? Why are we stupid in your sight? Do you think you know better than even us, Job? Their tone grows increasingly accusatory and bitter as the story progresses. They leave no room for saying, I don't know. I am so sorry. I don't understand this, Job. I don't get this. I don't know. There's no sympathy. There's no compassion. There's no humility. They blame the victim, they correct Job's lament, and then they attack him for crossing a line that Job wouldn't dare cross. In chapter 15, or yeah, in chapter 15, verses, verse 4, they say, but are you doing away with the fear of God? Do you not fear God, Job? Are you turning your back on God, Job? Ironically, Job does fear God, and the words and the actions and the attitudes of the friends are doing nothing but to show that they are the ones that, in fact, don't fear God. The friend's belief system is so threatened by Job's experience that they attempt to even defend God by using it. They start to realize, if Job's innocent, then they're in real danger of having their theological system come crashing down on them. And when it comes down to it, they don't fear God. They fear what's possible if they are wrong. If they're wrong, what happened to Job could happen to them. Our neat and tidy but rigid theological systems that we put together sometimes can be really, really dangerous. There's certainly much we can know about God, about life, about salvation. We've been given the wonderful gift of the scriptures and the Holy Spirit, the revelation of God in Christ. 
But there are some things that we just won't understand in this life. And Brent mentioned that in the past couple weeks, talking about the inscrutable things of life, the things that we just can't make sense of, the things that we just don't understand. And this is where acknowledging things that are beyond our understanding is vital to walk alongside of those who are in suffering. Do you have room for mystery? Do you have capacity to admit what is unknown to you? Are you humble enough to say, I don't know? Or do you have a box, a shelf, a tidy system that you line up perfectly and apply any and all life situations into? Do you have an answer or a reason or a solution for everything? You see, Job's friends, they wanted a system. They wanted a system that made sense to them and a system that gave them answers. Job does want answers. He asks the why question throughout. But more than wanting to know the answer to why things were happening, Job simply wants God. It's a big difference between him and the friends at this point. There's a theological word called theodicy. And theodicy simply means you're trying to reconcile the good, or sorry, the bad, awful things that happen in life with a good God who is love. How can a loving God allow this to happen? Now, I'm not saying that we can't ever try to reconcile some things and understand things about God's character and how he works in the world. There can be fruitful questions and conversations that come out of that, but they're good things to pursue in the proper context. There's an author and theologian named Kelly Capick who says, theodicy doesn't belong in the home of the afflicted. It's not that we can't ever seek to know the answers to some of the why questions, but when we're not the one suffering, we're probably not the one to be bringing the answers to someone who is. People who are suffering are not looking for other people to make sense of it for them or to bring a list of reasons and solutions and fix-its along the way. The friend who is at the end of themselves, this is not the time and space to present your findings. Not only does it not reach the deep places of pain, but it can actually cause more pain on top of that. So Job does ask some why questions, but he returns time and time again to what he knows to be true. The friends, on the other hand, rattle off answer after example, after solution, after speculation, and it is a long and nauseating read to see the way they go about things. But throughout the book, Job is proving himself to be a wise man. And in Job 28, 28, he says, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. The friends, however, feel the need to defend God in the confines of their own system. Let me say, if wisdom is to fear God, then those who fear God should see no reason to defend him. When you see God for who he is, when you understand your place as a creature before creator, we understand that he is God and I am not. You see no reason to defend him. You can't defend him. In fact, your attempt to defend him puts him in a box and diminishes the glory due to him. The friends brought a faulty theological worldview into play and they accused the innocent Job of wrongdoing. They attempt to defend God because they fear being wrong more than they fear God. And so some good questions for us to be asking as we walk alongside of family and friends of ours who are suffering is to be saying, is what I'm offering them more for them or is it for me? Is what I'm saying or doing more about how I feel about the situation and some of the awkwardness that I feel around it? Or is it to attend to them in compassion and love and patience? Am I trying to offer them solutions and trying to fix the situation? Or am I pointing them to Jesus? Am I inserting myself into their experience in a way that makes it about me and my comfort and encouragement? Or am I truly seeking for their best in this moment? When we're willing to enter into the suffering and pain of another, we follow in the way of Jesus who came to bear our pain and suffer in our place. 
And those of you who are suffering right now, you've perhaps been burned by friends in the past, perhaps even this week, by things that they've said. Or perhaps in their fear of saying the wrong thing, they've kept their distance from you, and you've wondered, where are they? Why have they not come to my aid? Why have they not called me? May I point us to Jesus, our truest and better friend. He sees you. He knows you. He cares about you. He weeps with you. He is present with you. He is gentle and humble. He emptied himself and came for you. He comes to bear your pain and suffering. I want to read for us from Isaiah 53. I don't have this on the screen, but I want you to to listen. And if you want to close your eyes and listen to this, just let this sink in. This is Jesus. This is the heart of God right here. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep before its shears is silent, so not he opened his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? And then in John chapter 11, the story of Jesus coming to the tomb of Lazarus being with Mary and Martha. And Jesus, in this moment, in John 11, verse 33, is standing with Mary. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her were also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Grief and sorrow and affliction and wounds, and oppression, and weeping. Jesus doesn't provide all the answers to all of our questions in this life, but he does give us all of himself. He has entered into our experience in full. He knows it deeply. He knows it intimately. He is with you in that. I want to invite the band to worship band to come back up at this time. We've pointed out a few things that we can take away from Job's friends about what not to say. And I don't want us to come away thinking that to be friends in people's lives as they suffer is for us to remain silent forever. As we seek to be friends who come alongside of others in the way Jesus does, I was reflecting on 1 Corinthians 13 this week, and this is where I want us to close off this morning. 1 Corinthians 13, of course, is the famous love chapter. It's spoken at many weddings. It's memorized by many. And it says this, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And that final line, verse 7, stood out to me. And I believe we can use it as a, as a litmus test for our words when we feel God is leading us to speak into the life of another, to speak in ways that line up more with the heart of Jesus than with Job's friends. And so perhaps we can be asking these four questions. Do my words protect people in their fragility? Do my words foster trust in vulnerability? Do they provide hope in the midst of their despair? And do they help them to persevere in their struggle? Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. And so as we consider some of the pitfalls of Job's friends, may we take the example of Jesus, the very heart of God, and the Bible's definition of love to guide our response. And may we, the body of Christ, rely on his Holy Spirit, asking him to make us shelters for those caught in storms. Would you stand?